Lymphatic filariasis, onchocerciasis, and sword transmitted helminths were the most cost effective interventions identified by this independent study. So, independently, the cost effectiveness of the interventions in terms of DALI's disability life years lost averted has been shown to be clear in comparison with many of the other interventions, issues around stroke, stroke, road traffic accidents and so on. And I want to put that against this statement made by Bernard Lisa about 0.6% of overseas of development assistance for health being allocated to these conditions. Why so little when the efficacy of the interventions and the cost effectiveness is so profoundly uh, different? Now, bearing in mind that figure of 20 cents per person per year, and the fact that countries are receiving essential drugs, I looked at the WHO global health expenditure analysis. And I've taken two countries, Liberia and Malawi, which coincidentally, unit costs of per capita expenditure, sorry, per capita expenditure on health are around $26, of which around 10 to 12 are what the country national health budgets provide. Now you can't pay, you can't provide much for $12. Now, when you look at the costs of delivering these free products, essential medicines, would only be 3% of the national health budget. It would be 1% of the total health expenditure per capita. So countries themselves have to make the decision as to whether they feel it's worth distributing free medicines at that relatively small percentage of the national health budget. And so my belief is that given the benefits which we know derive from these interventions, it's a good health buy. Now, I want to talk about innovation because the Vice Chancellor mentioned innovation earlier on. And this is a statement from the previous DG, Dr. Brundtland, who said, if we're serious about innovating, to address infectious diseases of poverty, we need to look beyond product development. And these diseases really do demonstrate what communities can do to innovate. And just to show you a few examples. First of all, this is the dose poll, which doesn't need to be sophisticated but it shows you the number of tablets anybody of a particular height can have instead of weighing people. It's a surrogate for weight. This slide is a snakes and ladders game developed by Professor Ekpo in Nigeria for health education of children in schools for schistosomiasis, to avoid schistosomiasis and understand schistosomiasis transmission. And he's done the same with a board game about worm infection. Now, these are innovative activities which are very cheap. Guinea worm, which I'll talk more about tomorrow, a horrible condition which Ghana has eliminated totally. A group of people came up with a drinking straw to allow people to take water in which might be potentially contaminated to stop acquiring the water fleas that give them the infection. It's very cheap, very simple, almost indestructible, and can be given to populations at virtually no cost. Just a plastic tube with a filter on the end. I like this. This is a text, uh, uh, an exercise book given to every primary school child in Burkina Faso, showing them how to avoid acquiring guinea worm and how it's transmitted and also highlighting the knowledge of the emerging worm in order to report any cases. Now the point about having that on the front of an exercise book is the child has that every day, going to school, brings it home, informs the parents. And that is about health education and the efficacy of health education, 
and dissemination and knowledge. And on the right hand side is a picture of uh, cloth in the market. This was sold in, um, I think, in French speaking countries. But it shows a woman protecting the water supply by filtering the water. It shows the consequences of guinea worm with disability. And it shows on the backdrop how water fleas look. So that was sold in West African markets during the 1990s. Very effective health education through a very simple approach, which people were prepared to pay for. Now, river guinea worm has made a spectacular decline. I'll talk again about this tomorrow. But what I want to emphasize is progress from 1988 to now has been spectacular. From around a million new cases a year in 16 or 17 countries down to only 20 odd per year. And the point about that is it's been based only on public health measures. There's no drug, no vaccine, and no diagnostic. The diagnostic is a worm emerging. So no technology has contributed to the solution of this problem. It's been about containing cases, surveillance, some insecticide used in the water to kill the water fleas, but basic public health measures have done the job. Now, looking at uh, roughly a million new cases of guinea worm, when I was working in Burkina Faso, in 1975, this was the scene in many of the villages in Burkina Faso. And I suspect, although I wasn't in Ghana at the time, it mimicked the abandonment of villages associated with river blindness uh, at that time. Um, the river blindness program started in 1974 as a result of a visit by Robert McNamara from the World Bank, who went to this village called Samandini on the Black Volta, 40 miles north of Boba Jolasso, and was shown the villages, the blind people, by a French entomologist, René Lebert. And McNamara had a legacy with him, and that was he'd bombed the hell out of Southeast Asia. Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. And his wife said to him, who was with him, Robert, you have to do something about this. And that was the first time that the World Bank got involved in the health program. It was a dramatic change because this is another picture by a man called David Baldry, who's in this picture. This is again taken in Burkina Faso, a place called Wajin, uh, 40 miles kilometers uh, east of Ouagadougou. David Baldry is the only sighted person in that picture. That was 74, how many years ago? I've lost count, but no, 40, within a 40 year period, we've seen a dramatic transition. Nobody in these regions now goes blind from river blindness and the valleys are fertile. Maybe they're overpopulated and degraded, but nobody's going blind anymore. The same applies to filariasis, and I mentioned that in the Vice Chancellor's contribution to the program. Elimination as a public health problem is not an end in itself, because we need always to continue surveillance, and this is crucial, uh, absolutely, for every one of these conditions. Um, but we mustn't forget the people who remain with disability. So the more management of morbidity is absolutely critical, despite the fact we might be able to stop transmission. And the numbers of, I, of countries which are in the process of confirming they've stopped filariasis, first of all, China and Korea did it a long time ago, showing it can be done. China in a population of 350 million people. Um, but more recently, Cambodia, Tonga, Pacific Island nations, Sri Lanka, Togo, and now Malawi are being analyzed and verified 
to the absence of transmission and the elimination of a public health problem. Many other countries uh, will be going down a similar route. So what is the rationale for the policy for these diseases? First of all, we're addressing the poorest. We know the interventions work and they are pro-poor. We know the drugs are safe and they have an impact beyond necessarily the target diseases. I think the success is borne out by a billion treatments a year in 70 plus countries on the basis of effective public-private partnerships. We know the economic rates of return from studies across the, the planet are between 15 and 30 percent of every dollar invested. The unit costs are low for preventive chemotherapy. We have multiple impacts and we know the donated drugs are reaching a high proportion of the population. But I want to come to what the last part of the talk. We are talking about a very dynamic situation. I haven't addressed the issues of vector-borne diseases, but the yellow fever mosquito is lurking out there. It's getting commoner in settings like urban areas of Africa. It's extensively distributed uh, in the Americas and in Asia and it's transmitting dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. And remember yellow fever? Well, Ghana still has the requirement of showing your little yellow book when you can enter the country, associated with the international health regulations. The yellow fever epidemics took place last year in Angola and in Brazil. And it's ironic that Brazil has still got yellow fever because it's the country that produces most of the world's vaccine. And the most effective vaccine we have for any condition is 10 years protection with one shot for yellow fever. But there's also another beast behind it, the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, which is now in France. And I think that we're going to see with climate change increasing evidence of epidemics of viral disease. The challenge is around conflict, security issues. We see an expansion of this horrible condition, leishmaniasis, in the Middle East associated with the war in Syria and previously in Afghanistan. We need greater commitment of government to recognize the link between these diseases and poverty. We do risk drug resistance and insecticide resistance, but we have to look at capacity strengthening and this is where organizations like UHAS and the leadership from UHAS is important. And there's a great lack of people who actually understand the vectors. We also have the challenge of the urban settings. And in Guinea Worm, we have an even bigger problem in terms of satisfying the requirements for eradication because of emergencies of reservoir hosts in dogs. And reflecting on these issues, um, the importance of uh, what's called M-Health, mobile, using uh, mobile phones, cell phones, GPS, tracking systems are going to be vitally important. The top right picture is a picture of, sorry, is a picture of a Yamamami community in the Amazon. Um, we're seeking to eliminate river blindness from the Brazil-Venezuela focus of this disease. And of course, Venezuela is in serious trouble with civil unrest. And Brazil and Venezuela, even before the current situation, really didn't have very much in the way of diplomatic relations. But this is some of the most remote parts of the world where access is virtually impossible. But these communities this is just a, a Yamamami compound. It's very interesting because, unlike us, we know where we live. We have a name for our community, our town, our village. These communities don't have that concept. They don't name a place because they just use the resources of the forest and having used those resources, move on and establish a new community. And that is extremely difficult to manage in terms of getting access to populations who are in most need. Then we have 
this tragic picture of natural disasters. This is the earthquake in Haiti, which disrupted programs uh, during the latter part of 2010-11. And then environmental degradation. This is again in Brazil. Um, exploitation of the rainforest. And here, this is a picture of Kumasi, the challenge of actually implementation of programs in urban settings. And I've been privileged to work with Dr. D'Souza in Noguchi on this particular topic. 50% of African populations are going to live in urban centers by 2030. And that creates all sorts of challenges. And this slide is about the different directions of travel that one has to have in these programs. It's slightly typical motorway, but here we have a rural road. And this is a road in Mauritania, uh, right in the middle of the desert, somebody taking some chairs and tables to a school. This is a river in the Amazon, and this is somebody using a mobile phone to communicate with the market about the value of his cow. That's the power of the mobile phone, because he might turn back if he's the price isn't right. Um, I just want to say something about the time it takes to implementation. Ronald Ross, who was the first staff member of my institution in 1900, 1901, first recipient, British recipient of the Nobel Prize for Medicine for the discovery of the transmission of malaria, he advocated bed nets for the control of malaria in Sierra Leone in 1901. So it takes a long time for people to recognize bed nets are uh, useful. Um, and I know there are people in the audience who've been promoting bed nets, but you know, 120 years is a long time to get something so obvious into in implementation. I mentioned taxi traps because they were developed by the Portuguese in Sao Tome in 1905. They eradicated taxi flies from the island. But where was the first use of an impregnated insecticide for vector control onto materials? Now, I'm not suggesting you know the answer, but I do. It was in 19... 44, 1945, during the Second World War, in this country. Buxton, from the London School, bought a sample of DDT, which they put on Hessian impregnated taxi fly traps in Wa and Lara, and succeeded by using those traps and cutting down the vegetation in reducing the incidence of sleeping sickness from 200 cases a year to about 20 or 30. We've forgotten about that, because somebody then said, what about impregnating bed nets with insecticide? We forget a lot, and it takes a long time to implement. Just to finish, we're living in a changing world. This slide came courtesy of Sir Andy Haynes, used to be director of the London School. It shows what are socioeconomic trends over the last 50 years, going up. It's all about population, gross domestic product, and so on. You can look at the slide online. Aligned to that are the threats to the Earth system. Increased carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and methane, global warming, stratospheric ozone, sea surface temperatures, ocean acidification, all as a result of our activities. And the frightening thing is that the relationship between climate and conflict has been published, and for every one degree change in temperature, the frequency of interpersonal violence and intergroup conflict rises. And this is a map of Africa, with it superimposed the sizes of US, China, Europe, and India. Projected population two by 2050, 4 billion people. But the impact of climate change is going to have a dramatic effect on crop yields, which are projected to decline by 20% or more by 2050. And there will be high levels of water stress. 
talking to colleagues who work in Nigeria, they see rivers which always flowed, the same in Burkina Faso, the Kamoe River. They flowed all the year round. Nowadays they dry up. So we're in a changing world. And I know AB will be resonant with this. We have non communicable diseases, pollution, road traffic accidents, mental health, conflict, diabetes. These are major health issues over the next decades. Probably pale into comparison with neglected tropical diseases. And we, over the last 10 years, since our program started, have seen the global financial crash, Ebola outbreak, Arab Spring and ISIS, natural disasters, conflict, Trump, <laughs> and Brexit. I don't know, well I didn't know until last night, that if I left this country on Saturday, I would be a member of the European Union. For me, that's tragic. And as I said at the beginning, in reference to John Mills's vision, if only we had politicians with the vision of John Mills. So NTDs are markers and agents of poverty, over a billion people afflicted. We can make a proportionally greater investment in people's health by a relatively small expenditure. And I believe it's my responsibility and that of many others to articulate this. And we have the scientific evidence to show that it works, and we have evidence from programmatic success. And I always say, if we can't deliver drug, free drugs to poor people, the challenges that we face in international health of more complex interventions are extremely difficult. And these problems, the NTD problems, are actually what I describe as low-hanging fruit. So I shouldn't be disabled by the belief that only three diseases matter, as the aliens perceive as they approach planet Earth, nor should we be blind to the opportunities we have and the achievements that have been made. And finally, my thanks, particularly to you, Hass, for this incredible opportunity and privilege, and to the Vice-Chancellor for his vision, leadership and commitment, but to many others, including people in the audience, because without AB, without people like the Ghanaians here, like Daniel Boachi, Fred Binker, Fred Ruwarapa, and many others who I hope to be able to call long-standing friends, we couldn't have got this far. And to my students, and particularly the late Dominic Keelan, who um, Johnny elegantly showed, and also to my family for their tolerance of being able to go and work in such beautiful places like Ghana. Thank you. Okay, sure, sure. Thank you very much, Chairman. I haven't met him previously, I'm sorry. Thank you. Your microphone is still off. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you, you have to learn to take your microphone off. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Molyneux, for your very interesting talk. We, as part of our tradition, we provide some time for interaction, for people to be able to ask questions and make some contributions. Uh, so I think there will be a couple of microphones. Where are the microphones? OK. So if you catch my eye, now I'm the speaker. So if you catch my eye, then I would allow you to make Yes, I can see uh, Dr. Amaya doing. I'm sure she's going to talk about mental health. Thank you so much um, for that wonderful presentation. My VC is right. I'm going to talk about mental health. You had a slide that listed the various challenges that mental health go through in the relation to NTDs. Do you see a way of NTDs tagging onto mental health or mental health tagging onto 
um, NTDs to gain traction because um, mental health still have serious challenges in terms of funding, in terms of everything you listed. So I'm looking at a way of these two entities coming together to help each other move forward and I'll be interested in your thoughts. Thank okay. you. I'll take three questions and uh, Professor Molino would respond. Another person? Okay, uh, ProVC wants to make a comment. Okay, thank you very much. Professor Molino was my professor when I was a student in the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. So as usual, I'm going to ask him a question. <laughs> well, um, I'm, I'm wondering why from the slides you showed, the information you provided, why malaria has been taken out of NTDs. And this is my reason for asking this question. You showed a slide where the quality of antimalarials we are taking are substandard and sometimes counterfeited. When I cast my mind back in the early 2000s, there was a lot of support for control of malaria, but that has dwindled so much, meaning that it is being neglected. So by my definition, I feel that you should add Malaria to your list. Okay, I'll take the third question and then uh, Professor Molini would respond. Uh, yes, I can see who it is. Uh, just mention your name and, ah, oh, okay. Um, Prof, my name is Brobe Imano nursing level 300 students. Um, I would like to ask, last year during the lecture series, we got to know the role of academia in making health a universal. So I would like to ask, in this, what will be the role of academia in helping to eradicate or reduce NTDS? And also, Professor asked uh, or talked about the drugs that get to countries, about 12%. So how are we going to make sure that we get the drugs? And also, what will be the role of the government in helping to control NTDS? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me try and take them in order. Um, the mental health question, well, it, it came to us almost out of the blue. Let me refer you, if you want, to go to a website, because I read a blog today by Julian Eaton, who is the head of mental health at the London School and advisor to CBM on mental health and NTDs specifically. So if you go to the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine website, you can see the blog. But one of the messages that comes out of that is, he quotes, there is no health without mental health. Now, if you look at the global burden of disease, mental health, and I think I'll be corrected by AB if I'm wrong, is the group of conditions that causes the greatest level of morbidity and mortality. But within that category, depressive illness causes the most. Now, one of the interesting things about the work we've been doing, because we've been assessing the burden of depressive illness in some of these diseases, and 
uh, if you take, and I take leishmaniasis, which is a horrible lesion, uh, you get it as a child, but the lesion stays with you for life. And that causes depression and so on. So you have a lifelong stigma capable of causing depression, having an impact on marital prospects, particularly in females, with the result that the years of life lived with disability are enormous. And if you have mental health sequelae, the disability weights with mental health are so much higher than any of the NTDs. To give you an example, the filariasis disability weight is about 0.1. If you have severe depression associated with any of these conditions, the disability weight is 0.6. So there's a total discrepancy in the disability weights attributed to many of these conditions. We've done the studies um, and are doing studies. That's why I was in Kumasi with Richard Phillips, with Baruli. The impact on the quality of life, on the social setting and the ability of people to communicate and work within communities and families is severely affected and has impact on their mental health. But it also has an impact on the caregivers. And we wrote a paper in 2012 with one of my students and I involved her because her parents were caregivers of one of her um, a disabled uh, brother uh, with mental illness and she volunteered to be part of this paper because of the impact on caregivers of quality of life and mental health and that is an area there are no papers on this except one I refereed yesterday on podoconiosis it's a staggering deficit, but coming back to it, you ask the right question, how do we, how do you? And let's think about this as a potential collaboration. Work within communities to work out how we get some kind of mental health provision. I've had a student who's been in Ghana with sight savers on this very issue, looking towards the NGDOs, because looking to professional psychiatrists, if we think we're short on the ground with other skills in medicine, I don't know, well, you've probably got the figures, how many Ghanaian psychiatrists there are working in the right... I mean, it's, it's just, you know, you don't find them. So that's the answer to that, and I'm happy to talk about it and put you in touch with people who will be able to... Because I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, also, sometimes when you're in charge of an administration, like the Vice-Chancellor, you need to be. Um, now, malaria, why isn't malaria an NTD? Well, it's very simple. It's got far more money. It's not neglected. I mean, look at the numbers. I mean, how many bed nets are going out there? They don't check, by the way, now that the bed nets work. The Global Fund is putting out permethrin impregnated bed nets into areas where there's proven insecticide resistance. It's a bit like the counterfeit medicines. That's not ethical. Um, so I don't, we, I mean, AB, I'll, I'll hand the responsibility on this one to AB because he was there at the time. We put the net net to DCEs together. And I think it wasn't in his mind either. It certainly wasn't in mine to put malaria into NTDs. Why? Because what were the avians saying? There are only three diseases on the planet, malaria, HIV, and TB. So they don't need money. They had a huge momentum initiated largely through David DeBarra and Rollback Malaria. And um, the Global Fund was established for that. How much per year is the Global Fund getting? I don't know what the current figure is, but it's billions billions. So I don't think... The other problem is, and I work with Vinan Nantuya, who was a senior policy advisor at the Global Fund, and indeed published with him uh, in the British Medical Journal in 2004, suggesting that the malaria and lymphatic filariasis communities might get together. The person at the at, um, 
Gates Foundation thought this is a brilliant idea and we all got together in Seattle and all the usual stuff, um, but nothing happened. The only thing that did happen was when the Carter Center demonstrated the impact of bed nets and, uh, on filariasis in two states in Nigeria and the Minister of Health said we've got to bring these programs together and actually made a, a legal condition about bringing malaria and filariasis together. That was great, but actually nothing happens. Policy to implementation is the issue, and it didn't happen in that case, despite the fact it being established in some kind of legal framework. Um, now, the last question, I just scribbled it down. Can you, you might repeat, drugs and control, what was it? I lost the, lost the precise question. Oh, that's, do you know what? I think academia has been critical. Um, look, the Vice Chancellor's contribution in filariasis, I mean, is a very good example. I think the insights from some of the studies that I referred to all came from academia. Uh, I think that academia is often grossly underestimated in terms of its contribution uh, because that's where the brains are. That's where the ability of institutions like this, which are independent, free thinking, can actually challenge the norm, challenge the policy. Um, the two examples I didn't refer to, um, the, the one on Ambisome, which is the drug donated by Gilead for visceral leishmaniasis. That came out of the laboratories in Liverpool when Michael Chance and Roger New published a paper in Nature in 1978 to show the efficacy of the combination of amphotericin B and liposomes. And it worked. It took 30 years to get it into a drug donated for visceral leishmaniasis, which is the most efficacious drug and saves people from being de dying. It takes a long time to get these things through, but it came from innovative research in an in environment of a university. It happens all over the place, and I hope that the issue of challenging the norms being independent, getting the funds to do things on the ground is continued by UHAS in the future. It's absolutely critical. Um, so I believe academic, academia has made a massive contribution and we're very privileged to be able to do it independently and not be controlled by drug companies or WHO or anybody else. So in my view essential because it's the intellectual power that comes to make the evidence for the policy and from policy to implementation. Thanks. I'll take the last round of questions, uh, maybe another three, if, if there are any. Okay, uh, Professor Binka will take it first and then followed by you. So thank you very much for this great talk. Um, I still have uh, a follow-up from the third question you were trying to answer. I still have a few questions or a few doubts about what exactly uh, is the role of academia. You've demonstrated that the cost effectiveness of these drug deliveries is very low, extremely low. If I were a donor, I'm sure by now I'll stop giving out the drugs. If most of the drugs that are given out actually are effectively not reaching those who need it most. And maybe the reason has to do with the way this implementation happens. It's like the military type rule where you go through volunteers who are not paid and you are expecting them to give these drugs to people who need them. And the interaction between the health system doesn't work. So countries get this because they are poor, but they don't play their own part of the game. So it's like dumping the drugs into the countries and just throwing them away. Uh, what do you think we should be doing to get this 
on oh. a better footing. Because ah. this is completely a, a, a disincentive to those who are spending millions to give out the drugs to the poor. I, should I take that one? Uh, um, I think there's a... We have to be adaptable about how we get these drugs, the donated drugs, out there. I think we've learned lessons and are still learning lessons. But I believe that, <clears throat> I think also we have to look at the fact that many of these donation programs, and mass drug distribution programs, are based on a particular model, and that was the community-directed treatment, and that was probably too embedded in our thinking, and we were not adequately adaptable. Um, I think that the issue, and I've discussed this with uh, Johnny, on more than one occasion, and that is the link between these programs and the health system. And indeed, I invited him to write a paper in The Lancet on this very topic, because what I feel as a, let's say, a disease-specific person and a biologist is that I'm not equipped to understand the complexities of this link and the health system's role. Um, and um, I think the other thing about this is, and I recall engaging AB in the Oncocercosis Control Program in, when was it? You tell me, AB, 1990-something. The point was, AB was somebody who understood health systems, thinks broadly, coming to look at a program which was intensely vertical for obvious biological reasons. And so we had to get out of the, the box we were in to start thinking more broadly. I don't think I can necessarily, nor am I equipped, to answer the, 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 the broader questions that you raise. But what I would say is that countries have not committed perhaps as strongly to this uh, momentum as people like myself might have liked, but there's a significant amount of donor support going in. There are expectations that countries make a, an increasingly greater contribution to this. But I think that we say the proof of the pudding is in the eating, in the sense that vast quantities of drugs are being used appropriately, and people are benefiting from it. And I don't make any apologies for that, and I hope that this, there is <coughs> adequate evidence that this program or these programs actually strengthen the health system because of the issues of improved logistics, improving the surveillance, improving the drug monitoring, the reporting of side effects, the many other issues which health systems actually have the responsibility for. So, I mean, I would be happy to engage in, in a debate but I don't think that um, we've had in any way a detrimental impact on health systems, although there are people who claim that is the case. Okay, I'm sure Fred and David will have a chat during the reception. But I'll t I want to take the two students up there and the member of council down here as the last. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Idrisu Mohammed. Um, I want to ask this question. I want to know why within some developed and developing countries, the burden of neglected NTDs are often overshadowed by other public health issues like prescription drug overdose. Thank you. I'm Coach Salom Emmanuel. Please, my first question is that... Uh, oh, you want to have two? <laughs> three. Three? Three? <laughs> I can't cope with it. What was the first question about drug overdose? Just, then he will, he will remind you. Yeah. Can you choose one so that we can have a chat during the reception? Choose one. Listen to this, then he will remind you of the first one. Yeah, okay. Please, let... <laughs> All right, the first one is that we are moving from uh, the MDGs, that's the Millennium Development Goals, and we are going to the Sustainable Development Goals. And then in aid for universal, or focusing on universal health coverage, my question is that uh, what opportunities 
does the new international policy environment have for entities? I think I think that is the a second very, one. A very, is a, that is a very big question. So we'll take that, and then we'll take Dr. Meho uh, as the last question, because. MDGs and SDGs and NTDs is a whole okay. topic. So we take Dr. Ameho's question as the last. David, my, I have a two-in-one question. The first <laughs> part is very what? simple. As a student who's been here, uh, I never lose opportunity to learn. Would it be okay for me to go home with the message to my household that NTDs are actually diseases of neglected populations? Yeah. Okay, that's the first part. Right. Now, um, given where you stand, um, do you see the possibility of, let's say, epidemiologists like you, people, disease control focused people like yourself, working across silos? with, let's say, EPI, if what we believe is true, that uh, every child everywhere is being reached with vaccines, do you see the possibility of, let's say, NTD intervention delivery mechanism being linked with EPI yeah. programs as a way of health systems innovation or improvement to deliver the efficacious and cost-effective interventions that you've talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think I got the, the last two. Let me start with your comment. Um, I think that what we've seen with certain programs is an incredible compatibility and interaction uh, between programs, particularly in terms of surveillance. Let me give you an example. Um, it was very difficult. It, I was in charge of the WHO mission in Nigeria for guinea worm. And now, as you know, Nigeria is a vast country with a population of nearly 200 million people. But the point is, why were we convinced that Nigeria had succeeded in eliminating guinea worm transmission? Well, because the guinea worm program and the polio program had worked together and every time somebody went to a house to immunize the po for polio they showed the household guinea worms picture and said have you seen this so we knew that there was widespread information going out there and very effective surveillance the river blindness program apoc has been working very closely with bed net distribution, vitamin A distribution for many years. And I am assuming in this country it's still going on. So there's what you'd like, you can call it piggybacking if you want, but it's happening. And more recently, we have this scare, it's more than a scare now, we have new, two new cases of guinea worm in Angola, which is about as mysterious epidemiologically as you can ever get. Because these two cases, or one case, the first case was within a few kilometers of the Namibian border. Some 2,500 kilometers from the nearest endemic area in South Sudan. Completely in inexplicable. But it was found because of the surveillance being undertaken by polio programs. So, the information exchange between these programs at government level with the uh, agreement of government and the recognition that this is important use of resources is critical. And the same applies to EPI programs. So I don't have a problem about that. And I just think that it becomes even more cost effective and even better linked to the health system. The second point, SDGs, um, can't remember the precise question. But the, the thing is this, that if these SDG targets are to be achieved, it's going to be a, a two-way street. NTD control programs will impact on one set of issues and achievement of SDG targets, for example, in terms of water and sanitation, 
will have an impact directly on sustainable on the targets for NTDs established by WHO. So it's a two-way street. Um, and so this is why I think this is, well, litmus test is a good word, which was invented by WHO. Um, I, I'm pretty convinced that um, there will be major challenges in the establishment of the Sustainable Development Goals. I think the asp it's aspirational rather than realism-based, particularly when it comes to issues of um, environmental um, uh, controls, issues around sustainable cities, given the rate of uh, at which cities are expanding. And I think the, I have to say, climate change deniers who think that things can go on forever. And okay, um, I don't know whether you're involved with the sort of momentum to try and reduce the use of plastic in the oceans, um, but you see the amount of plastic being poured into the oceans in places like Indonesia um, is it, truly frightening. Now I know that oceans are not necessarily part of this health dimension, but the issues of loss of biodiversity and the relationship between biodiversity loss and increase in vector-borne diseases is, I think, well established. Because what happens, and it's classic in the Brazilian Amazon, there are groups of insect vectors which I've described as generalists. And generalists emerge when there has been a change in climate and ecology because the biodiversity is reduced. When biodiversity is rich, you have a large number of diverse species of Anopheles in this case. When you get rid of the biodiversity through building roads, cutting down the forests, exploitative mining and mineral extraction, then you get one mosquito coming in which becomes dominant and it happens to be the best vector of malaria in the area. And so maintaining biodiversity in as pristine a setting as possible is, is in my judgment, uh, essential. But is it going to happen? I think not. Um, the last point was about, I think, prescription overdosing. Uh, I didn't get precise question. I didn't get it either. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I apologize about that. Anyway, the point is that I, I, we don't, we don't, we're not, we're not using prescription drugs. We're using drugs which can be delivered by non-medical people. There is a real issue uh, of ensuring that people aren't, get, aren't getting overdosed. What is amazing is that the relatively small number of severe adverse events that these programs have generated. I think, Johnny, you were involved in the early stages of this monitoring for the adverse events for filariasis. And you probably had the first case of very serious adverse events in this country, which you spotted. But I don't think there have been many since. So, five in Ghana. Well, that's probably more than anywhere else on, in the world, isn't it? Which is unusual. Anyway, the point is that the number of serious adverse events has been limited. One problem with the drugs for schistosomiasis or bilharzia is you give it to children, but they need to have had food beforehand. So giving through schools is important because it's essential that the children have had a meal before they take the drugs. So that's one of the issues you've got to be um, aware of. Um, but on the whole, we're talking about safe drugs, quality drugs, you know, I make that point again. I mean, we're talking about billions of treatments. It's not just a few. And as I said earlier, this is demand driven because in some of these communities, these are the only things they get from the health service via the communities. Anyway, I think, Chairman, thank you. If that, if we can answer questions in a one-to-one -one whatever. Yes. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Molyneux, for your uh, 
very enlightening talk. It's my responsibility now to give some closing remarks. I will not attempt to summarize the lecture in any way, uh, but it's clear that the whole concept of branding to be able to achieve the desired goals is very important. That mentioning those mouthful names like schistosomasis, trypanosomasis, oncocercasis, lymphatic filariasis, chikugunia, it's, it's, it's a mouthful. And uh, you, you really, really have to explain to people what this is. But we are talking about diseases of neglected populations, as Dr. Ameho said. And uh, if there are interventions that have been proven to be safe, uh, then it is the responsibility of the health system to ensure that we deliver these interventions, particularly when the drugs are being donated uh, by all these drug companies from GSK to Merck to Pfizer and all of them are making their contribution to the specific uh, drugs that are being used. That is the essence of partnership. And uh, for many of these big drug companies uh, who are usually uh, seen to be milking the, the general population, uh, they see this as a public good and they feel very good that they are contributing to this. So it's very refreshing to note that a company like Merck and GSK have decided that they will donate these drugs for as long as they are required. And then our health system which should be delivering these interventions, uh, sitting back. Um, and we've, we've been told that the, the cost of the delivery is around 12 cents per person. So what is it that is stopping us? We need to work together and break the silos of our EPI is here, malaria is there, uh, what do you call it? Uh, TB is there. Even the global fund money, which is TB, malaria, and uh, HIV, uh, don't mix. This is malaria money. And then the regional directors and the directors of public health, district directors, say, no, 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 this is HIV money. Uh, this, is, this is TB money. We need to deliver services to ensure that our communities benefit from all the proven interventions that are available. Otherwise, the science that you contribute in generating this knowledge doesn't become useful. So we need to look at opportunities for integrating our healthcare service delivery. Very, very important. And the whole concept of universal health coverage and achieving our sustainable development goals uh, all comes into play in this environment. I want to thank Professor David Molyneux for his very enlightening talk. One thing I enjoy about David is when you ask him any question, he'll be able to cite a particular paper, the year in which it was written, and if you are not careful, he can even tell you the page on which I mean, he, he, has, he has this photographic memory. He's been saying it. In 1996, we published this paper. It, it's all the way through. It's, and it's amazing. As far back as 1944, he can tell you all the papers. So, um, David, thank you so much for coming. And I believe that tomorrow will be another opportunity for us to look at the second phase where you'll be focusing on disease eradication and guinea worm in particular. And I'm sure there will be a lot of opportunity for us to learn together. Uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor was telling you that uh, he went to Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And, yeah, so even those of us who went to the London School don't don't complain. <laughs> <laughs> I
I, 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 want, I wanted to, to steer a few things in Dr. Samoba and uh, uh, Professor Molyneux. One time, Professor Molyneux met me and said, Johnny, you know, I like you, but why did you go to London? You should have come to Liverpool. Uh, the rivalry always exists. It's just like Haas and Kotoko. It's our forever be, uh, I don't want to say even NDC and MPP. <laughs> and on that note, I thank you very much for this day. The university choir gave us a musical interlude.
Shall we give them another hand of applause? That's the university choir. They will have an inauguration on the 13th of May. And you are all invited to the ceremony. Um, I have a, Mr. Chairman, I have a tall list of persons that I have to acknowledge. This is almost beginning to look like a scientific conference in the WHO. I have so many big, big, big names. When they were talking about SDGs and NTDs, did you hear MCQs? <laughs> he didn't hear that. That's multiple choice questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please permit me to introduce to you our regional minister, Dr. Archibald Lecher. We are pleased to have him here. Reverend Johnson, Johnson Avulata is the Deputy Regional Minister. They came together. Then I have a list of um, our colleague uh, representatives of the other higher educational institutions in uh, the locality. Dr. Kenneth Nyalemegbe is the acting president of the EP University College. Mr. Adon is the acting registrar of the same college. He's here. Honorable Isaac Kodobisa is the representative of the Regional Education Office. Okay. Um, Dr. Emmanuel Lecho is the regional, is the rep of the whole Technical University, our sister university. Dr. Mrs. Charlotte Osafo is the rep of the governor of Bank of Ghana. And we are pleased to see you here. We are coming again, you know, yeah. Mr. Kofi Siabi Mensah is a past um, registrar of UHAS. And as you have been told already, Dr. Delano Dovlo was our 2017 lecturer, the presenter for I think he just stepped out. Dr. Dovlo, you are on the spot. Shall we give him a hand? <laughs> Professor Fred Binka is our former vice chancellor, actually the founding vice chancellor of this university. <laughs> Dr. Moses Adibo was a past awardee. Um, we gave him an honorary doctorate last year by this time. Shall we give him a hand, please? Dr. Nefi Asamwaba is also the former Deputy Director General of WHO. What did I tell you? <laughs> Professor Michael Wicks Wilson is from Noguchi. Prof, is he here? Yes, on, on my right. Professor Daniel Bwachi is also from Noguchi. <laughs> Dr. Gloria Kwanza Asari is the former Deputy Director for the Ghana Health Service. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Director General, my apologies, Madam. Women, eh, women power. Thank you. She was with us last year. We are always pleased to see her here as well. Professor Kojokura. Noguchi, popularly associated with Noguchi. Dr. J. Jom K. De Souza is also from Noguchi. I think we have a, a, a huge representation from Noguchi. Professor Kofi Anyidoho is our former council chair. Shall we, shall we get the applause louder? He's always with us. Thank you, Prof. It's good to see you again. Ms. Victoria Kelly is a director for the road DDNS PH. Forgive me, I cannot. Uh, plenty, director, something, 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 director. Public health. All I can see is the PH. That one I know is public health. <laughs> Dr. Kwesi Jokoto is also the MDHS for Ho. Mr. John Imbro is an, an alumni 
rep on the University of Ghana Council. Thank you, sir. Dr. Isaac Sekom is the medical superintendent of the Rara Hospital. We have a special affiliation with them, and so we are happy to see you. Thank you. Dr. Seydou Mustafa is my colleague registrar from the University of Professional Studies in Accra. My other colleague from UNEL, University of Energy and Natural Resor Renewable Resources, Mr. Solomon Pamford is also here. The 66th Artillery Regiment is also represented in the person of Flight Lieutenant Hazel Corbina. Shall we give them a round of applause? This is very special to us because we know that within we are enjoying the community goodwill and most people are here represented. Now our traditional rulers who are constantly supporting us and joining us in their full regalia all the time. Togbi Fiakoku the Ted is the paramount chief of the Sokode traditional area. Togbi Kojodo the first is the chief of Sokode Lokwe. He's actually our landlord. Please let the applause be big. We also have some reps from our donor agencies. Mr. Smith Sandra Ajavon is from ADB, is here. And then we have a chief from Avatime, Osie Aja Tekbo, the seventh, the Osie of Avatime. Where are the Avatime people? He's representing the Volta Regional House of Chiefs. Togbi, thank you for coming. DSP Anthony Kamal Danso is the whole district police, police commander. We have representative from, we can see our students are here with us. We, can you wave to us? School of Hygiene. NTC Ho, Maoli School, Sunrise SHS, Awudome SHS. Thank you for coming. How did you come? <laughs> Soccer Day SHS and Ola Girls. Um, that's my school. <laughs> Can you give them a hand of applause? <laughs> Understand all Ghana Health Service staff. Can we acknowledge you, please, if you are from Ghana Health Service? Thank you so much for coming. Least but not the least, please look upstage. The man in the middle in the you has cloth, as has been introduced already, but let me do that specially, is our chairman of council, his lordship, Justice Victor J. M. Dovlo Doce. His lordship, thank you for being in the seat once again. Our pro vice chancellor, who I almost always forget, is here, Professor O.A. Thank you very much. We have some visitors, some old schoolmates of mine who have also joined us. Shall we just uh, welcome them to Ghana? Mr. Jimbediako, Dr. Ajimbediako and spouse. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, Honorable Regional Minister, our Council Chairman, and all our specially invited guests, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and honor to thank all of you on this memorable occasion. 
on all our behalf. I want to thank God for a beautiful day. It hasn't rained today. I'm glad that we were all attentive and focused on the presentation and will continue to reflect on the issues as we go back to our various destinations, especially when we now know that Trump is a threat to all of us. I will continue with my appreciation by thanking our Chairman of Council, our Regional Minister, you has, and especially to Professor David Moline, our distinguished scholar and speaker for the occasion. It has been a thought-provoking lecture, and I believe that you have all benefited something from it. Distinguished guests, uh, former Chair of Council, Professor Kofi Anidoho, and our past immediate uh, founding VC, Professor Fred Binka, have always been supportive of this program, and we are very grateful to you. We thank all our traditional rulers who have joined us, as well as our members of council who are with us. We thank all of you distinguished heads of departments, states, and private agencies who have made the time to be present here with us. I want to thank our colleagues from VCG Ghana who are here to support us as well. Thank you to our deans and directors and students especially for coming all the way. I didn't forget, I was just coming to you. Have patience. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. We will have the session tomorrow again and I'm expecting a bigger and larger crowd. Uh, there is something small to make you happy before you go so you can come back again. I want to thank the planning committee for the occasion. And I want to um, say that the planning committee, um, architect Hola and her team, we thank you so much for all the little decorations and the little, little things that you have done to make this occasion beautiful. We thank you so much. Finally, I pray that the Lord will carry you safely to your various destinations, and we will see you here tomorrow, 3 o'clock sharp, and have the first, the second dose of the lecture series. If you are in agreement with me, say amen. amen. Thank you very much. We'll invite Mrs. Victoria Quatson to give us the closing prayer. Shall we be on our feet if you can? To God be the glory, great things he has done. Father, we want to thank you. We started with you, you have been with us throughout, and you have brought us to a successful end. We say, may your name be praised, may your name be honored. We pray as we are living here, let your presence go with us. Take us safely to our destinations and bring us back again tomorrow to continue the second session. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for answered prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please let's remain standing whilst the dignitaries leave. The choir will give us some songs, possibly. After the dignitaries have left, students, please remain seated. Please, invited guests, you can please follow them. There will be a photo session, so kindly follow them, please.
Nursing Training School of Hygiene, Ola, Mauli, all of you, please remain seated. You have students, remain seated. that when they are ready, you just go through where you came out, you pick it, join the bus, and off. Row by row, please, no rushing. Mauli, all the SHS schools, School of Hygiene and NTC, we've given everything to your leaders, so you see them. 